So what, again, uh, to introduce myself, I'm Swami, I'm one of the TAs in the class, and we'll be talking about uh, reinforcement learning. Hopefully, some of the things that you've learned in the class so far would be useful for how I go about the lectures, but we'll see. Um, so to get started, this is a problem that all of you have come across time and again in the, lecture, in, the in the course so far, the standard optimal control problem. Uh, the standard optimal control problem, you have uh, the cost. You can see this, right? Um, so you have the, and please do pardon me for my handwriting in advance, it's going to be horrible. Uh, and then you have the dynamics constraints, you might have other constraints, but we're louder. Um, and you might have other constraints as well, but for now, we're going to ignore them. And just deal with dynamics constraints and like the problem that like you've already seen a bunch of methods to solve this problem, even with additional constraints. Uh, and the one thing that most of those approaches that you've seen so far don't seem to tackle is what if you don't know this dynamics or you don't have a dynamics beforehand, right? And that's sort of the fundamental problem we're trying to tackle here with reinforcement learning. And like, in fact, you can actually summarize most of reinforcement learning research by saying RL is essentially optimal control without an a priori model. Right? And if you don't have access to a model, right? And if you want to solve this optimization problem, uh, you can, you can, the most straightforward way, which I can think of at least would be to say, I will just have, start from a specific state, do a bunch of random things, see where I end up doing those random things, compute my cost for a lot, for most of those trajectories, and then try to improve my actions or try to choose actions where I perform well, right? So do a bunch of trial and error, and from those trial and errors, try to see what is sort of the, re the most reasonable thing to do. And so, and that's, in, in RL, we're going to do a little bit fancy version of that, but that's sort of going to be the gist of what we end up doing, right? So do a bunch of, random rollouts and then use that to optimize your actions, right? And, but before going at, like getting into the specific details of how we go about it, like it's worth pondering off uh, and seeing why it's, it's even useful, right? Anyone has any suggestions for where you would expect this to be useful? Why you would even care about scenarios where you don't have a model or you don't know the model? Do you want to control? Right, robust control might be one scenario. You essentially stochastic dynamics, you might have partial observability, right? So for example, you, you can only see part of the scene, you can't see the entire scene, and you don't even know how the model evolves in partial observability. Uh, you might have scenarios like manipulation where you're only getting information from a camera and you don't know how the world evolves. You're only interacting with the world using some sensors and you do actually don't know how the sensor measurements would evolve, right? You don't really know the model in a lot of those cases. And this is in fact something that you'll encounter time and again with manipulation, especially um, where you'll be trying to interact with an environment and the environment will have a lot of aspects of it. Like for example, objects in this case or humans or a number of things. And for most of those things, you won't have an a priori model and you'd only be observing parts of it. You won't be observing true aspects of, like you won't be observing the masses of each of those objects here. You won't be observing the exact pose. You have to infer those poses, so on and so forth, right? And in a lot of those cases, it turns out that some of the optimal control methods we've, or before that, uh, some of the RL methods that we'll develop for the vanilla use case would actually transfer in a very straightforward manner. And in fact, you do, you actually since you don't care about the model at all, um, if it, you you don't care if it's super nonlinear, you don't care if it's super it's not differentiable, you don't care if it's partially observable, you don't care if it's stochastic, uh, 
you can essentially sort of use the same set of tools that we'll discuss here um, for most of those scenarios. And the other thing which is sort of been underappreciated until recently is the fact that a lot of these RL methods that we'll discuss are insanely parallelizable. And what that helps you do is if you have something like a GPU, it really speeds up how quickly you can learn a policy or how quickly you can learn the a Q function or things that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. And what and when you combine all of these, what you observe is that we've had a lot of progress with deep networks and like related function approximators. And in a setting like this, it turns out like these RL approaches we develop would actually work really nicely with these powerful function approximators that we, we've been working with um, for a decade now, right? And uh, we probably won't go into how exactly all of that happens. We don't have enough time for that, but uh, it's just useful to keep that at the back of, of your mind because a lot of what we learn learn here might seem primitive, but like they just end up scaling to insanely large problems as well. Um, the model is the model of the man to the world. I'm sorry, you could tell me. Make the model the model of man to the and the world together. Uh, yeah, so both, so you typically have a reasonable model for the manipulator itself. The model that we don't usually have is for the environment or the world. Um, and, and that's sort of what ends up making most of the difference. Um, and so that is that. And so like, let's, let's try to see what are the standard approaches people try to use in order to uh, actually go about learning in some of these domains, right? Um, and there are a bunch of approaches, right? Uh, there's the most obvious thing from an optimal control perspective is to say that if you have, let's say, a bunch of interactions with your environment, if you have a bunch of interactions with um, the system that you're dealing with, you can try to learn a model from those interactions, right? You can try, try to, you, you, you can say that you'll try to learn, let's say, or you'll try to minimize an optimization problem again, but in this case to, let's say, learn a model. Right. And let's say this is over X U X dash. And so as long as you have these transitions of current action, current state, and next states, you can try to learn a model which essentially can be substituted in here. Right. And once once you learn that model, you can sort of say that we have a bunch of these optimal control methods that you've learned over the class. We just use one of them with this learned model to do optimal control, find the optimal actions. Um, and a few caveats there: if you're learning, if you're using a neural net or like some complicated function approximators with some weird nonlinear dynamics, you'll probably have to do sampling-based methods, which I'm not sure if Zach has covered, as opposed to a lot of the gradient-based methods for optimal control that you've uh, learned so far. And but having said that, there are still a lot of caveats. Um, can someone guess the problems that you'll have with doing this? Uh, just learning a model like this and then trying to do optimal control with that model. Nonlinearity non is definitely one issue where like, if you need to have a sufficiently complicated model in order to learn um, fit a complicated set of um, functions, right? Um, but there are other issues fundamental to the problem. Um, any other guesses? In fact, one of the most prominent problems here is that the objective that you're trying to minimize here is not the true objective we care about, right? Like we, we actually care about the final cost that we get out of the optimal control to the trees. And so if we end up trying to minimize this error and let's say we have a complicated uh, model that we're trying to fit to, uh, we're going to have some error in what we end up fitting to. And if we have a little bit of error, that error when you try to computed optimal actions using some optimal control method is going to explode as you go for lot longer time steps. And one of the reasons that it happens is because you're trying to model a lot of unnecessary things you actually don't care about, right? Like, so for example, if you're looking at this specific use case and you're trying to learn a model for images, you're essentially trying to see how each pixel is varying across time steps. And you don't necessarily really care about how each of those pixels vary, right? And, and so when, and what that ends up leading to is that you don't end up capturing a lot of important things about the model that you actually care about is, which is how those objects move if you do some specific, if you perform specific actions or how humans react, let's say if you're, if, you're, if you're working with humans, if you perform specific actions and so on and so forth. And so, and, and this problem broadly is called the objective mismatch problem. 
right? And uh, this is sort of fairly prominent with uh, model-based RL methods. And the, the other problem is related to what we just discussed, which is that if you have a very complicated model, you're learning a lot of unnecessary things and it's super hard to learn. And so you are trying to capture Right. And so both of these seem problematic. Having said that, people have managed to make these work reasonably well in a lot of domains. Um, you can have reasonably complicated function approximators to model even very complicated dynamics, even images. And so uh, with all the caveats out there, like these, these problems still exist. It's just that we have found ways to sort of mitigate them to some extent. Um, and the way we have managed to mitigate them is by using some of the, some of the methods, some of the other RL methods we'll talk about in a little bit. And so the fundamental point here is that we want, we don't actually want to model everything about the data that we've collected, we actually only want to capture, let's say, some task relevant quantities, right? And, and that's sort of what some of these other methods try to do. And so what we'll, what we'll be doing with Q-learning, for example, is to say that we'll try to learn an action value function. And the action value function, let's say, parameterized by some function phi of some parameters phi would be modeled as, sorry, um, we'll try to approximate the approximate cost to go Pro given some specific um, state and action. And again, like this is so op optimal cost to go, not approximate cost to go. And so what that's essentially trying to say is that you want your function approximator to be able to learn given some state and action, what is the optimal cost that my controller or my planner can get. Um, and as you might guess, this is not straightforward because you don't actually have an optimal trajectory. And so you can't get access to the optimal cost to go. And so there are ways we talk about at circumventing this issue and trying to still learn this. Um, but it, it's but we did manage to solve one issue, which is that we, from doing this, we're able to go from trying to learn everything about our task to just trying to learn task specific information, right? And that's that can be super useful at times. Um, but this as well has some issues. Uh, any any guesses on what those issues might be? Oh, before that. Once you have have uh, a function, once, once you've learned a function approximator for the cost to go, finding an optimal action is very easy, right? Like you just have to solve. Well, it's not very easy, as we'll go into it in a little bit, but you can at least imagine doing this by trying to solve an optimization problem on the use, right? So you can have given some state, you just try to minimize uh, the skew function with respect to the use to get u star, um, and that's our. You can, you, know, you can at least hope that we'll be able to do this. Um, but even then, it has some issues. Any guesses on what those issues might be? I'm sorry? Dimensionality curves would be an issue in all of these methods. <laughs> you're, you're not, you, you won't be safe. Like, you're not going to be uh, like any. As soon as you get into the RL domain, uh, given that you're not using the gradients of the model, you're going to have dimensionality issues in all of these methods. This is going to be actually one of the better ones uh, when it comes to dimensionality issues, um, but there are issues related to that though. Right, so what, what you're essentially trying to get at is that you'll have generalization issues, right? So if, if your model domain or like if your domain slightly changes, then this won't generalize because this you're you're learning a very task specific uh, Q function. Whereas if you'd learned a model, you just need to swap out swap out your cost function and you'll sort of generalize to some other task as well, right? And so there are generalization issues. There are other issues as well, and we'll talk about them in some depth in a little bit, which we'll call bias and what that essentially. High bias. And what that will mean is that when you actually try to learn a Q function using some of the algorithms we'll discuss, we'll actually end up learning something completely different from the actual cost to go that we want wanted to learn. Right. And we'll get to it in a little bit. And that causes some instabilities, it, it causes weird convergence issues, so on and so forth. Yeah. If we have already computed, then why do you want to <clears throat> Right. So the point is we can't, right? Like, and, and that's that's what I was trying to get at is that. Like, although you want to approximate J, 
you actually can't compute GN optimally because you don't have the optimal bus to go, or you don't have the optimal trajectory for from your next time step onwards. And so, although we want to do that, we can't just do supervised learning and do that. We'll come up with more sophisticated ways of trying to do that um, for for some of the some of the scenarios we look at. And it is when you use those algorithms is when you have some of these biases used and stuff. Um, so this search, uh, like find the approximate the optimal will be approximate optimal. So you're you're essentially trying to get the optimal cost to go to some approximation based on how well your model uh, how how well your neural net function approximated. So that, that is the value function. It's just the action value. So it is so the value function is or the value function that we've seen so far is the optimal cost to go for given only the current state. This is trying to find the optimal cost to go given some current state and action. And so it's saying that you're taking the specific action, but from the next state onwards, you're taking the optimal action somehow. Okay. Right. Um, and there are some advantages of doing that. We'll get into it a little bit. Um, why you would use this one of the reasons why you will use this is because the minimization is like once you have this, you can just do the minimization, find the optimal actions. There are other reasons in about like actually having to learn this as well. We'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. Can you just go over that part again? The value function in the I'll go into it in a little bit more detail in a little bit. Um so 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 that's that's that. Uh but even here, right? Like yes, uh if if you know the model, if you know the cost function. The simplest thing to do would be to just learn a policy, right? And what we were trying to get at at the beginning, right? Like just do a bunch of random rollouts from those random rollouts, see which which of them are doing reasonably. You choose the actions which were doing the best, and that's in some rough sense is what policy gradient methods do. And what they try to do is essentially say that if you have some um, if you have some cross function, you have you don't have access to the model, but you can perform rollouts. And what you'll say is that you'll perform a bunch of random rollouts. You'll see which of those rollouts perform well, and you'll try to move your policy or perform gradient steps on your policy to move it towards regions where you performed well, right? And we'll call those gradient estimates, zero to other gradient estimates. And you can do something as simple as that to learn just the policy. You don't actually care about any of the Q functions. And so the equivalent thing here compared to what we have learned so far is for example, we'll call the policy pi, pi of x. This is sort of similar to the LQR gain that we had seen a while back, right? Like for LQR, IQR, et cetera, which is that if, if you're given an action, you can essentially just do k times delta x or k times x if you're trying to move the origin uh, to get, or minus k times x, I'm sorry, to get, to get the policy, right? And so you're trying to do something very, very similar to that. And a lot of the nice properties that you saw with LQR would also transfer over here. So robustness to noise, robustness to um, weird, like even if your model is not super accurate, like so all of the, all of those properties will sort of transfer over here. And, but again, you don't have any free lunches in machine learning at least. And so uh, this also has some issues. Any, any guesses on what those issues might be? <laughs> So it's actually related to the dimensions issues you talked about, where if, you, if you're looking at zero thought of methods, they're actually super inefficient as you scale up your dimensions. Um, and so as you go into higher dimensional problems, this would become super slow to converge. And the and what that original what that originates from is the fact that zero thought of methods in general are super high variance. And so the gradient estimates that you compute here are going to vary a lot. As, as as you change uh, the amount of noise, you add a little bit, and like so, as you go into larger, higher dimensional problems, or as you go into even more weirdly looking problems, you'll have to take a lot of samples, or you you have to perform a lot of rollouts to get a reasonable gradient estimate, here, right? And so um, you'll have, and if you don't end up taking a lot of estimates, it'll be pretty unstable. It won't converge. You'll have all kinds of issues, um, and so you have high variance. You'll have instability and a lot of things. We'll talk about how you handle them, where that actually comes from in a little bit. Um, and there's a fourth class of methods which sort of try to combine the Q learning and the policy gradient methods 
and they're called actor critic methods. And so the hope, or the hope there is, we'll probably not get too much into detail here, but the hope there is that like if you combine properties of both, if you try to learn both the Q function and the value uh, and the and the policy together, maybe you can get somewhere in between. Where maybe you can trade off between the bias and the variance that you have here, right? And so uh, what we'll primarily look at here is the Q Q learning and the policy gradient methods. And a lot of the intuition there is sort of going to transfer to the actor critic methods as well. And we'll try to at least tease the actor critic methods to the end if we have time. Um, and so coming to Q learning, which is what we'll tackle uh, the beginning. The problem we discussed here was that it's very hard to, we don't know what the target cost to go is that we want to estimate. And somehow we want to be able to, we want a learning algorithm which can compute the Q values without having the true cost to go uh, with us, right? Um, we have seen something like this related to the value function stuff that was mentioned here, right? Uh, we did dynamic programming. Where we had an update rule, something like this. Um, the problem with this rule for our context is that this requires uh, the dynamics in the minimization problem. And what that means is that you actually need access to the gradients or the Jacobians of the dynamics. And so, <laughs> dynamics, we don't have access. Right? And it's not just the update rule, even when you even when you try to compute the optimal actions um, to, to roll this out, it'll, you'll have this, you'll have a similar minimization problem again with the model and you don't have the model. right? And so this is this is not great. But in fact, what you see is if you switch and go from this to the Q function, what you'll get is something like this. So U plus um, Yeah, you you dash at the next step um, actions and um, states. And what you see here is that if you use a similar bell of uh, dynamic programming type update for the Q functions, the dynamics doesn't appear here anywhere. All that you need to do this is a bunch of trajectories where you have the current state, the action that was taken at that state, and the next state. right? And if you have that, you can essentially just do this over an entire data set of examples and get an optimal Q function. Uh, but again, you can't just do dynamic programming with neural networks or like function approximators. What you instead do is try to compute, try to get the residual of this uh, that, of the of this equation and try to minimize that residual. And so it looks something like this, where you have the Q function at the current step, at the at step n, and then the target estimates by doing a single step Bellman backup using um, the using the Q function estimates of the next time step, right? And so if you minimize this problem over, let's say, a bunch of exa bunch of um, examples that you might have in your data set, or a bunch of these triplets that you might have in your data set, you'll be able to converge to, uh, or hopefully, you'll be able to converge to a reasonable Q function. There are, again, caveats, which we'll get to in a minute. And again, as we discussed, once you have the Q function, you can get the optimal actions by just doing performing by just solving this minimization problem, right? Um, we sort of in a handy manner said, we have a data set we'll use to perform these uh, updates. We didn't quite talk about where we get this data set from, right? Um, and turns out that's not that easy, right? We, if we don't have an act, if you don't have a good policy, we won't have a good data set. We won't have a reasonably good set of examples to do this through learning on. And so the question is, how do you get this? Um, any ideas? Right, but like, so whether it's simulation or the real world, the question is how do you actually get the actions that you want to execute in to get a trajectory? Because what you'd need to do is you'll have a bunch of, like you'll have, you'll start with some state, initial state, you'll execute some actions, and then you'll get some rollouts to perform these updates on. How do you get those actions is the question, right? You could do something like this, where you might have the current estimate of a Q function, which would be bad. Using that, you can, you can get some optimal trajectories that the Q function thinks are great, get, get an initial trajectory, use that to perform the updates, and then cycle back and forth. Get the updated Q function, use that to again, get some trajectories, again, use that to update the Q function, so on and so forth. The problem with that is that you'll get stuck in local minimize, 
um, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be very biased. That's where the bias comes from. Where if your Q function is bad, you'll only end up going to bad regions and you would, and you might improve in those local bad regions, but you would never explore to find what the useful regions are to explore. And you won't get experiences in regions where you might actually need those experiences. The other thing to do would be to say, we just take a bunch of random actions and use that as the trajectories to perform these updates. That again is problematic because if you just take random actions for a lot of tasks that we've seen so far, random actions are not going to get you to the optimal state that you want to get to, right? And so, or not in, not in any reasonable amount of time. And so the question is, can we do something in between, right? And that's sort of what we end up doing in most cases. Um, we'll, we'll compute the optimal actions based on the current Q function estimates and add a little bit of random noise there. Uh, for continuous actions, this would look something just like uh, unit normal or some normal distribution. For discrete, distrib for discrete actions, this might look like a discrete multinomial distribution or something. But the point is that you're essentially trying to compute the optimal actions corresponding to your Q function, and then use it, adding some random noise to, for some exploration. And this exploration sort of makes sure that you're sort of in regions which at least your Q function things are reasonable, but at the same time, the noise helps you explore and escape local minima that you might get stuck in. Um, and as it turns out, it also relieves you of some bias issues, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And uh, the Q learning folks have some funny names for their bias issues. They call it, they, they, what, what, what you have is something called an underestimation bias for when you're using cost functions, where your Q function estimates would actually be lower than what you'd want them to be. Or when you're looking at the reward scenario where, you're, where you have your environment giving you rewards, it'll be an overestimation bias. And the, the reason or what the, the RL folks call it is, the deadly, uh, they say it's because of the deadly triad, which is a combination of these three factors. I, I don't know where machine learning folks come up with such uh, interesting sounding names, uh, but you'll see a plenty. You'll see plenty of these in the literature. Um, so, what we are saying we have in deadly triad is, if we have a combination of these three factors, or even just these two, um, you can, you'll have issues of these underestimation bias issues. And what you're saying is that if you're using a neural network or a function approximator to approximate your Q function, and if you're performing these types of updates where you're using the current estimate of your Q function to perform the rollouts, or you're using the current estimate of your Q function to um, as your target to supervise your current uh, or to do the Bellman backups, right? Uh, you'll, which is what is, we'll call that bootstrap. So if you do, if you have a function approximator and you're simultaneously you're trying to do bootstrap or perform these kinds of Bellman updates, you'll have an underestimation bias. And the reason that happens is because let's say you have two consecutive states at Xn, Xn plus one, with some, let's say Un plus one, which you're trying to estimate and Un, and you have the corresponding Q estimates at these, um, at these time steps. Let's say you're performing an update here, which reduces the Q value, right? It performs a reduction in the Q value. And what what function what having a function approximation does is that it sort of moves your Q estimates across your entire domain, and so for all states which are close in some measure to your X n or your current state, will also have their Q values reduced when you perform this update. And so what that what that does is that in all likelihood, like consecutive states are going to look similar, right? And so what that does is it'll also when you perform this Bellman update on Q n you'll also have this reduced automatically because you're using a function approximator. And as a result, when you perform this update again at like the next time step or at, at, at the next time you, you encounter these states, what will happen is that the arg min that you compute in your target Q values will actually end up choosing the same sort of states and you'll get a biased estimate, right? Your Q value is supposed to be somewhere here, right? But it's you're going to have a lower estimate as your target because of the function approximation errors. And what that's going to lead to is that the update this time is going to say, go down further. And once it does that, this also will go down further. And then you'll, you have a do loop where both your Q values will keep going, or keep, keep going down, right? And this is specifically because you have a function approximator and you're taking a min over the target Q values. Um, and this gets even worse if you have off policy updates, but we'll probably not get into that. Uh, any questions here? Yes. 
Right. So, so when we model Q functions using any function approximator, what we are essentially saying is that we have some function Q of i, sorry, Q of i, which is taking x n u n and splitting out the values, right? And what that implicitly does is it says that the, the reason it's an approximator is that it says that it'll sort of smooth, smooth, smooth the values which are close together. So if you have xn and xn plus one or any other state which are close in some weird measure, this will sort of smooth across those values. So if you perform an update on xn, it will also change the values of xn plus one implicitly because you're using a function approximator. And so what that does here is that when you perform an update on qxn, it will also change the values of qxn plus one, which is not what you want, right? And that results in this bias issues where it changes your value of qxn plus one, you end up using qn plus one to update qn, and you cycle cycle back and forth, and it just messes up, right? Um, so does that make sense? Right. Right. So, so the the equation above is just an equality, right? So, and the reason I rewrite it like that is because if you have a tabular or like we're just maintaining a table, you can just update the Q functions. But when you're using function approximators, you need to compute the residual and then minimize it, right? That makes sense. Anything else? Does that make sense so far? Or am I going too fast or too slow? Yeah, approximation part makes sense, but why it keeps going down like you know, so, so what you what I'm guessing you're saying is it could go up or down, right? Like why just go down? Um and the reason it goes keeps going down specifically is because you have an additional minimization here, right? And so there might be some Q, Q values which might actually have gone up, but the min is going only going to choose the Q values which actually went down, right? And so let's say you have five actions and you end up choosing a specific action and like some of those went up, some of those went down because of the updates. But when you're performing the next update, you'll only end up using the actions which actually were the lowest, right? Which probably went down. And so it inherently biases the updates towards Q values which go down because of this minimization. But at some point it should converge. So it won't like the reason it won't converge is that when when this goes down, it will make the QN go down because you, that's what that's the update you're performing. And when QN goes down, you'll again have QN plus one go down. And then so it keeps accumulating. That's in the hypothetical scenario, but like in practical scenarios, it does sort of converge, but again, it converges to a lower value than you would expect it to. Does that make sense? Right. We don't want to minimize, so we want to minimize Q with respect to the actions. We don't want to minimize, so we want Qs to approximate the optimal cost to go. We don't want to minimize the Q values with respect to phi, right? Um, we want Q values to actually approximate the optimal cost to go. And then once we have that Q value, we want to get the optimal actions by minimizing Qs. Um, we don't want the Q values for all states to go down. Right? That makes sense. Right. Um, and so any, any ideas on what some, some of the solutions here might be? So one thing that people do is they try to decouple the target Q function and the current Q function, right? And so if you noticed here, I sort of sneaked it by you, I sort of parameterized this as phi, phi bar instead of phi. And what this phi bar typically is, is an older approximate of your, uh, approximation of your Q function. So you might, be, you might be updating your Q function, but you'll store an older value of your Q function, let's say a few steps, a few updates back, and you'll use that to compute these target values. Likewise, there are other, and, and this is called double Q learning, Uh, and use old Q value estimates. And the other thing very related to this is that they people use uh, two sets of Q values or two, two Q functions simultaneously 
And while computing the targets here, they'll do min of u or max of one comma two or max of q one q two, and they'll have q phi one whatever comma oh man I'm so bad at this q phi two right uh, and again minimization over here right so you have q two q functions you take the minimum of both of them. And then finally, when you're trying to actually compute the updates, you take a max over them. So that sort of is a hacky way of saying that if you have those issues of cascading errors, you sort of just have two Q functions and likely both of them are not going to get messed up together. Um, and so and that's called TD learning or TD3. I forgot what it was called. Uh, yeah, I'll just say two target networks. I forgot what it was called. The paper was TV3. I forgot what it's called. Um, right? Uh, and then you take uh, max over Q1, Q2 when you're trying to compute the targets. Um, and having, and, and so I guess let's probably look at an example. How far are we in terms of time? 40 minutes. Uh, sounds good. Right? So this is a Q learning example. We I have to switch screen, screen share. Uh, this is messy. Um, screen share. No. That would have been a disastrous. Okay. Uh, right, so we have a Q learning example here, and what we are trying to do is a simple double integrator model, so linear dynamics with A and B. Um, we have like two states, one action, simple 15 steps. We are going to be trying, again, quadratic um, costs, so a very simple scenario. We're trying to, we'll be trying to do Q learning here. I'll go into the specific details of how we model the Q function here. Um, but to sort of get at where we're going, um, what we'll be doing is we'll have, we'll do thousand iterations of these, we'll run 50 um, iteration or 50 parallel rollouts in parallel to get to collect those experiences using epsilon greedy strategy that we discussed. Um, we will initialize the Q values here close to the true Q values. This function sort of gives me the true Q estimates because it's a simple enough example, I can I can get it. And we'll add some noise. It's supposed to be the wrong example, right. Uh, and we'll add some noise to the true Q values and see if it converges to the true Q values, right. Um, and the way we do that in the overall procedure is that we perform some rollouts with the current estimate of the Q function um, and some added noise. Once we get those rollouts, we'll store those rollouts in X and U's. Once we have those rollouts, we'll compute the costs for each of those rollouts at each time step. Once we have the costs, we'll use those costs to compute a gradient for the Q function. The way we'll compute the gradients is essentially have the optimization, the minimum, the, like the optimization that problem that we described a little bit earlier to minimize that residual. Uh, we'll compute the gradients of that residual for each example in our rollout. Um, we'll store the gradients here, and then we'll just add up the gradients, essentially accumulate the gradients across time steps, across example, across rollouts, and perform a standard gradient-based optimization method to update our Q function, right? So here, in this case, we'll be using Adam to perform those updates. Um, and uh, to go into the specific details of how you're modeling the Q function here, we'll be, mo we'll be modeling that as, uh, like, given that we know the standard LQR problem can have a quadratic Q function. We'll actually be modeling it as a quadratic. We additionally need to make sure that the Q function is positive definite so that the minimization problem that we do, min over use, actually converges, right? Um, and so we'll be modeling it as a quadratic with L transpose L as the, um, as, as the parameterization where we'd be learning the L matrices um, 
and to go into each of these specific functions, um, the costs are straightforward. So I'm probably not going to spend too much time there. So you have some straightforward costs. Uh, the quadratic cost that we are familiar with, we are estimating the Q function using the quadratic estimate that we have. So QXX is the X quadratic on X. XU would be the coupling terms. U, QUU would be the quadratic on U, right? And so we are computing the Q values given any state action pair. Um, we have the Q function. We are computing the Q function gradients here. Probably not going to go into the details, but essentially it's just a gradient of the Bellman residue that we're all familiar with. Or actually, this is just the gradient of this Q. Sorry. Oops. Uh, the, this is just the gradient of this function that we wrote down here. Fairly simple. Is this a quadratic? We're trying to compute a gradient with respect to the Qs. Uh, this is the argmin, which is again very simple for a quadratic. It's just going to be um, Q U Q U U by or yeah Q U U by Q Q U U X. Um, Bellman residual, the step that we just saw, which is the Q function estimates at time step i minus the cost plus Q function estimate at time step i plus one. Um, and we also have an argument here, which we are getting from this function here, right? And so that's how we compute the Bellman residuals. And then we use this finally to compute the Q function gradients, which are again, the gradients of the Bellman residual, which is essentially, if you have a quadratic, it'll be the residual times the gradient of the Q function itself. And so we'll be computing the Bellman residual. And then once we have the residual, we just multiply it with the Q function gradients. And that gives us the gradient estimates, right? Um, I'm guessing and hoping that makes sense. Uh, and if you actually just run it, it will sort of converge reasonably well. The this is sort of the plot again. Remember that we actually can initialize the Q, true Q, the Q function close to the true Q function that we that we expect to get, and so it converges reasonably well to very small errors. So the true the true cost that you would expect for optimal trajectories is something like this. And the cost function we get is also pretty reasonably close. Um, and if you actually look at the Q functions themselves, they also look somewhat reasonably close. They are, they, they, the difference that you find here is actually larger than the differences in the costs. And that's because there is actually a manifold of Q functions which are all true, uh, which all satisfy um, the cost. And so the values themselves of the Q function parameters vary a little bit here. However, the, the thing to notice here is that if we actually increase the amount of noise we, we add while initializing the Q function, um, you have, and, and do the same thing that we just talked about, you'll have weird uh, convergence issues. And one of the reasons for these convergence issues is some of the bias issues we talked about. Uh, what happens in the beginning of training is that your Q function estimates are bad. And that leads to these messed up Q function updates. And so you end up becoming like, so it ends up becoming very unstable. And then finally you end up converging. And again, even after you sort of converge, you converge to a value which is, um, or to cost, which is not optimal, right? And so you actually have some bias in your Q function and you're not converging to the optimal thing. Um, if you initialize it far enough. And, uh, to stop the screen share again. Let me. Wait, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why it's the, the point of it was just to show that it's unstable. Uh, you'll actually not really know the Q function. Um, I was just using it to show that if you, if you initialize close to the true solution accidentally, you'll converge reasonably well. If you don't initialize, close to the optimal solution, you'll have issues. Um, that was the point of that example. And uh, the what that sort of shows is that if you, and to, to, to make that a little bit broader, what that's sort of saying is that if when you're, when you're trying to mitigate some of these bias issues, you need to make sure that you're choosing the architecture properly, you're choosing the problem set up properly, you're choosing the cost functions properly, taking a lot of those considerations into account to make sure that you converge reasonably well, even if you just randomly initialize, right? And so, again, there are going to be a lot of these tricks in RL. Uh, you're just going to have to live with it. Uh, but the point is that what we've seen is that, especially when you're using neural nets for a lot of these domains, 
you can sort of initialize them with standard neural networks and it ends up working reasonably well. Um, and as long as you're using some of these additional tricks to mitigate the bias issues. Um, if And that's sort of one of the reasons why we, we are even talking about any of these things. Um, yes. The, the, the parameterization of the Q function, yeah. Yeah, but uh, already we know that Q and R are positive. So, so, so that's the cost function. Uh, so that's again, sorry, sorry for the confusion there. So that's just the cost, right? When you're trying to measure, when you're trying to compute the cost, you'll have whatever you know the Q and R. You set the Q and R. This is the Q function you're trying to optimize, which is the cost to go, which is the sum of the costs for the next few time steps for some optimal trajectory. And those is that is going to be the sum of those costs, right? So this, that's what we want. Um, and they're saying that even that should be positive definite. Yeah, but every Q and R all those the time steps are positive definite. Yeah, but like, yeah, like if you actually compute it, it, it will be positive definite. Um, but like when you're trying to learn a Q function, it's not like the Q function, like if you just randomly initialize it, it's not going to be positive definite. Like the function itself is not going to be positive definite, right? It's only the optimal Q function that's going to be positive definite. And so what we are saying is that when you actually, like in order to, do like learn reasonably well and like have a reasonable chance of conversion. You actually additionally need to add a constraint on the Q function, like the random Q function that you're initializing, that it should always be positive definite, even when you're making those gradient updates on the Q function. And the way we enforce that on the Q function to make sure that it's always positive definite is to say that it is parameterized using L as L transpose L. Does that make sense? And so, no, no, no. So, again, I think let me let me go look. So, we are saying that this phi here is going to be L transpose L, right? Like this, the, the Q itself is going to be L transpose L. So, we'll concatenate, let's say, X and U, X and U, and this is how we compute the Q function. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so, and, uh, and then we're trying to learn L. Right, so so that's that's Q learning, um, and with Q learning again, like there are a bunch of issues as we just already saw. Um, computing, like again, before going to the negatives, uh, the setup that we just described as is sort of works reasonably well for discrete action spaces. And in fact, if you remember uh, DeepMind's Atari paper back in twenty thirteen or fifteen, uh, when it got famous, uh, it practically just does this uh, with a neural net with double Q learning and some of the tricks that we just mentioned, right? And so this, just the vanilla stuff that we just discussed works reasonably well for discrete action spaces for like reasonably sized neural networks and this can work well. Um, but if you go to con continuous actions, it's as we've seen that like not, not great. It'll have the bias issues become much more prominent. Computing the arg min is not trivial. Um, right? Like you can't just compute a min over some large neural network. Um, and so people don't usually use it as it is for continuous control. Um, the way people use it is they'll add an additional policy. They learn the policy and you function together. And that's called didactic critic methods as we sort of alluded to in the beginning a little bit. Um, right. Hoping that makes sense. Um, and, and that's sort of where the policy gradient methods come, come in. And these are sort of nicer for a lot of the continuous control methods. And this is sort of how people were solving continuous control problems for a long time in RL. Um, they would not use Q learning these methods. Um, although recently people have using some of these actical tech, um, tricks that we, that we probably won't talk about. Um, so coming back to policy gradient, uh, it's sort of the question that we started with, which was, can't we just use uh, some random rollouts and see which of those rollouts end up giving a uh, reasonably low cost, reasonably low, um, perform reasonably well, and just perturb our actions or perturb our policy to change in that direction, right? Essentially compute a zero order estimate of the gradient, use the zero order estimate of the gradient to, to update your policy. Um, the problem, or before going to the problem, let's just, let's just, Say that so, so the minim, the problem that we'll be trying to minimize would be something like this you'll have the cost as a function of some trajectories you have some expectation over the cost over the trajectories um and this itself is a function of your policy pi theta right um and you just do a bunch of these 
random rollouts, you see how this cost changes. And for the rollouts where this cost is the lowest, you try to change it to that, right? And so you're trying to use zero order updates, the policy. And then the way we go about doing that is that sample random trajectories by perturbing the perturbing theta a little bit, right? And then once you have that, move theta along zeroth order gradient directions. Right, and um, as again, we sort of already teased this, this has issues. Uh, do you remember what the issues were? High variance, High variance exactly. Um, and so we, we want ways to minimize that variance. And luckily we know a couple of things about our problem, um, right? One thing we know is the policy gradient, right? So we know we have, let's say, a neural net, or like we have some function approximators. We do know the gradient of the policy output with respect to the policy parameters, right? And that's any autograd library would give you that. And so we do know that, and we want to use that. We don't want to directly perturb the parameters and compute zero order estimates. We instead want to perturb the actions, which in most cases would be smaller in dimensions, and then do chain rule or something to compute the gradients with respect to the policy. And the way we'll do that is that we'll actually introduce a stochastic policy. And what this stochastic policy will do and what this stochastic policy will do is that given some parameters, it'll try to, it'll, it'll spit out actions that are close to what it thinks are the, like it's going to sa sample from a specific distribution, right? So it's going to have some uncertainty over the true actions and it's going to sample a bunch of actions as a result. And so you'll essentially end up sampling a bunch of actions, use those actions to compute the rollouts. And from those, so that gives you a bunch of rollouts that you can compute the gradients with. And you will use that to compute a zero order estimate of the gradients with respect to the actions, and then use chain rule to compute the gradients with respect to the thetas. The details we'll go into in a little bit. I'm sure it was a bit fuzzy. The other thing that we know here about the problem is the sequential nature of the problem, right? Um, we don't just want to use let's say perturbations at the current time or uh, the costs that we computed at some previous time step to influence how the current action or let's say the essentially the perturbation at any time step p is only going to affect your trajectory at time step t plus one onwards right and so you don't want to use the cost estimated at previous time steps to to influence how your how your um, perturbations at time step p changes Right. And, and that's what we mean when you're trying to say we want to exploit the sequential nature of the problem. And when we exploit these two things, we'll see that the variance will go down drastically. Um, and so to get into some of the details, we'll, pro we'll sort of also reformulate the problem a little bit. Um, so we'll say that we have an expectation over the trajectories that we sample using a policy and based uh, and over the expectation or and across all those trajectories that we sample, we want to minimize the cost to go, right? And uh, the distribution in our work trajectories here can again be expressed as something like this, where it's a product of the transition probabilities Right, uh, I'm sure that's totally unlegible. So uh, th that's a product of the transition probabilities, which is the probability of those transition with respect to, let's say, if you have a stochastic dynamics model, and the probability of the actions from your stochastic policy, right? And um, the the thing that we'll do with this is we'll try to minimize this. And the question is, when you have your distribution or as an expect uh, in, inside the or as over which is when we have your parameters inside the probability distribution with which you're taking the expectation on how do you compute gradients with respect to that quantity right and there and that's where i'm not sure if a lot of you heard about the policy gradient trick 
that's where that gets used. And it's a standard, like, that's not something that you'll come across again and again in machine learning, because it's something we do a lot in machine learning. Um, but for the optimal control folks here, that's something uh, that is not something you use often in optimal control. Um, and so the way we go about it is we say that we have this expectation, which we can expand as an integral. Um, and once we have done that expansion, we'll essentially just multiply and divide by the same probability distribution. So that remains the same. And then we'll notice that the term inside the brackets here is essentially just the gradient of log probability, right? And so we'll substitute that with the gradient of log prob. And we'll notice that now this term can be inside some, the expectation of this probability, right? And so we'll convert this into, oh shoot. Um, yeah, and so uh, we'll again convert this to an expectation by just wrapping this probability again inside the, um, the distribution with which you're taking the expectation. Uh, and then again here, we notice the distribution over trajectories which we expanded uh, expanded earlier. And so we'll just expand that into the probability on of the dynamics or the transitions and the policy um, action probabilities. You notice that this does not have uh, the parameters don't appear in this term. And so you can essentially just set these to zero. And all that you'll have is this term. And that's sort of what you get here. Does that make sense? And I will let you guys look at it a little bit longer. Um, right. And the intuition for what we get here at the end. It's sort of very similar to what we were trying to get at at the very beginning. Like, um, and what we got here is that we're saying that we'll compute, um, we have a bunch of samples, we have a bunch of trajectories. We will compute the gradient of for those samples with respect to the action that for each of the actions that we took using the policy. And we'll weigh those gradients by the cost or the cost that that specific trajectory got, right? And so we're saying that for trajectories which obtain uh, reasonably low cost, we'll bias the grade, or we'll, we'll take a gradient direction, gradient in that direction, and we'll move away from trajectories which had a very high cost. Uh, if we go in the negative direction of this gradient, right? And and so um, that's essentially what this does. And I guess like that's essentially the intuition we started with. This is sort of what we wanted to do, but we still haven't used the fact that we want to use the sequential nature of this problem, right? Um, we are still using the cost of the entire trajectory for each of those time steps, which is not what we want to do. What we want to do is we want to say that at any time step i, we only want to use, or at any time step, sorry, at any time step n, we only want to use the cost to go from that time step. And so what we'll say in a hand wavy fashion, is that instead of using the cost of the entire trajectory for each of those time steps, we'll only use the cost to go from that trajectory, right? And so we'll ex we'll write the cost to go as this, and instead of having j j of j of tau here, we'll simply substitute that with j n tau, um, which is the cost to go from that time step, and we'll weigh each of those gradient terms at each time step using just the cost to go uh, instead of the total cost of that trajectory. Does that make sense? Right. Uh, and, and that gives us the final policy gradient theorem, which is that if you have this, um, if, you if you want to minimize, or if you want to take a gradient of this expectation, you can essentially write it as something like this. Um, and intuitively, again, remember that all that we are doing is we are computing the gradient at each time step, and we're weighing those gradients by the cost to go from those from that time step, right? And so what we're trying to do here is we try we had a bunch of rollouts at each action, we perturbed the actions a little bit because of our stochastic policy, and we're asking the policy to move in directions with lower cost, right? That makes sense. Um, and and that's sort of it. Um. If people have, before we move on to an example, if people have questions, you can probably go into them. Right. So how do we do the rating? 
And the reason variance got reduced is that, again, bo bo using both of those things, is that one, we reduce the dimensionality of the problem in most cases, where now we're only perturbing the actions instead of the parameters, where if you have in your letter like a very powerful function approximator, you'll have a lot of parameters. And so you've reduced the dimensions on which you're per perturbing or like computing the zero order estimates of the gradients. So just reducing the dimensionality, as we talked about earlier, reduces the uh, the variance of the problem. Um, so that's one. That's what the policy gradient trick sort of helped us do. The sequential nature of the problem, what that helps us do is the fact that if you have, if you take a specific action and you're influenced by all the costs in your trajectory instead of just the cost to go, you have a bunch of these costs that you didn't care about, which unnecessarily change the gradient, right? And that sort of unnecessarily introduces variance. And the fact that you eliminated all the all the costs in your past time steps sort of reduces the variance uh, of the actual gradient estimate that you computed at each time step, right? Uh, and so that helps reduce the variance again. Right. And so to move on to a very simple example, again, similar to what we had earlier with the queue learning setup, we'll have a simple linear model with quadratic costs. And we'll parameterize the policy here as just the game matrix K as an LQR, right? Um, and since we want it to be stochastic, we'll add some a little bit of random noise sampled from a Gaussian. Um, and if we look at, so this is the cost to go starting from any time step n. So this is what we'll use to weigh our policy gradients. Um, and the policy itself is a Gaussian, right? We'll just centered on k of x, which is the mean, and um, the the difference of between those would be essentially the standard uh, Gaussian probabilities. And then uh, the, computing the gradient of the log of those probabilities, we get something like this. Um, is this some algebra? I'll probably not go into a lot of details there. Uh, so to get into some examples here, let me again, uh, I need this. Um, right. So again, um, we have the same sort of setup, linear dynamics, quadratic costs computing the costs using the standard stuff. This function now here is a little different. We're trying to compute the cost to go at every time step um, instead of just the costs. And then once we have that, again, compute performing rule outs, et cetera, getting, getting, getting to this, we'll again introduce a bunch of parameters for the problem. We have V, which is sort of the random noise we add on the policy, uh, which is the covariance of the, for the random noise we add on the policy. Um, we're initializing the k's to zeros, could be any other random number, for now it'll be zeros. Um, and then once we have initialized this, we'll again store the trajectories in these values that, you, that we've initialized here. Again, to compute the policy gradients themselves, we'll perform a bunch of rollouts, we'll store those rollouts in x's in use, and the noise that we added in each of those rollouts, we'll store that in v traj here right and note remember from the formula that we saw that v traj is essentially going to be used um, to compute the policy gradient and so this is sort of the policy gradient we compute which is just the formula that we saw a little while back which will be v traj times which is essentially the perturbation that you added times um, the gradient of the log right and which is essentially just um, the gradient of the policy which is um, x's uh, and then, so so that's the that's the gradient you computed, and then uh, you weigh those gradients by the costs, the cost to go, right? Uh, and so, and again, you got, got the cost to go when you're trying to compute the costs here. Um, and so you you weigh your gradients by cost to go, you aggregate them, and then you just use those gradients to perform. Um, to optimize your case using Adam or gradient descent or anything of the sort. Uh, and when you do that, again, voila, uh, converges reasonably well, converges pretty quickly, and again, converges to reasonably 
converges to values that are reasonably close, uh, close to the optimal costs, um, right? And if, even if you look at the key matrices themselves, again, pretty close to the true, true estimates. Um, and uh, the trajectory also looks sort of similar. But again, if you look at an example, again, this was a very simple example, right? Um, if you go to a somewhat more complicated example, so here we have a quad rotor, uh, which we're trying to, which we, again, play in a quad rotor, again, something I, I believe Zach would have mentioned, would have come up in some of the previous lectures as well. We linearize the dynamics of the quad rotor and try to stabilize the quad rotor along the stable position. Um, but this is a way harder problem than the double integrator problem that we just saw. And so, with with in, in this problem, when you try to linearize the dynamics and try to solve this problem, uh, doing pretty much the same things we just saw, you'll actually see that the costs blow up and you don't converge. Uh, if the thing to notice there is that it's one e seventeen, so it's it blows up that badly, and uh, that's sort of what happens when the variance explodes. Um, and so when the variance explodes, you need to be very careful with. When you're trying to use policy gradients um, or policy gradient based methods, what you can do to make this work is do the same thing, but add this one additional thing, which is something you've been doing all along, is to do a line search on each of the gradient estimates, right? So instead of just using Adam or any standard uh, gradient optimizer, you can just do line search on the gradients that you compute using policy gradients. And that converges reasonably well. Um, it converges pretty quickly. And then again, not perfect, still takes a long time to converge, but it does converge eventually. And again, you don't get something perfect, but it does stabilize. Um, it goes, eventually goes to zero. And if, in fact, if you run it for long enough, instead of just running it for a thousand iterations, if you run it for long enough, this will sort of converge to the true solution and look something like this. Right? Um, and so, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, line search is to avoid overshooting. Line search is to avoid overshooting. So, if you are essentially avoid not uh, avoid taking any steps when your gradient estimates are bad, right? So, if what high variance means is that instead of taking the gradient along the actual gradient or like compute, taking a step along the actual gradient, what you have is a noisy gradient version. And so, instead of going along the right direction, you have something that points in the wrong direction. And so if you're pointing in the right direction, you might have sort of hoped to like do Adam or whatever, which sort of unnews the learning rate eventually. And like, hopefully you would have converged, but if you're going in some random direction, which you don't know uh, at each uh, iteration, how, how good your gradient estimates are going to be, you want to essentially either not take a gradient step in some cases, then your gradient estimates are completely bad, or you want to take a very small step and gradient estimates are noisy, right? Like, but in, this, in, in sort of the right direction. And so that's sort of what the line search here allows you to do. Because if you look at this, the, the phenomena is very weird, right? And this was a very simple problem. Um, it like you have something that sort of like in the first few iterations, it was essentially flat. And then accidentally you had a reasonable gradient estimate. You went down again. It was a little bit flat. You went down and then there were periods of flatness and going down, right? And this was a very simple linear problem. If you go to go, go to more complicated problems, the flat regions that you have is all that you'll see. Um, and so the question is, and which is why, which is what we're going to say in a little bit, you don't actually practically use line search for most stochastic of in the in neural net regime. There are things you can do, like you can do like there are expectation based line searches which you can do in some stochastic domains. But for a lot of domains, like especially when you have these high dimensional functions, you typically don't use line searches. Um, in instead, what you do is uh, right. Um, instead, what you do is, which is what a lot of the state of the art RL methods do, is you use a trust region method. Um, which sort of says that you will get a gradient estimate, but just don't take, but just don't deviate the policy in the function space. Um, we haven't talked about what function spaces are. So what, what like a lot of trust region methods do is say that you want to be in within some threshold of where you 
started with. Um, and so you don't want your gradient to, go, to let you go too far in the function space. So you don't want the policy, even if you take a reasonable step in your um, parameters, you don't want your policy to change much. Um, or you don't want the Q function to change much when you use trust, trust user methods. Um, and so what, what they help you do is sort of do, get at something like the line search stuff, where you might take some bad steps, but you'll try to make sure that even if you're taking bad steps, you don't get thrown off too much. Um, and so in fact, that's one of the most common ways of trying to reduce the variance, which is to use trust region or to handle the variance trust region methods and where possible you, you you'd also want to use line searches instead can you can you guys imagine any other ways of reducing the variance like one one obvious thing would be to say that I'll reduce the amount of noise I add to the policy right so what that does is for example if like from finite differences or like in general with zero order methods as you sort of reduce the edge that you're perturbing your parameters or your actions while computing the gradient estimates the better like the more accurate or close your gradient estimates or like low variance your gradient estimates are going to be but even then the problem is going to be that like when you do that you're not going to be able to get rich enough gradient estimates like they're going to be very local and like especially when you have hard problems, like you won't be able to progress much. Um, and so what you typically in, essentially end up doing is that in the beginning of training, you'll have um, larger covariances. And then as you converge, you reduce the covariances that or noise that you add to the policy, right? So you essentially add a schedule to the covariances for policy. Um, Anything else that you guys have in mind? So that's um, also something we already sort of, when we try to do uh, Adam and stuff like that. So there's the stuff that where people, like, that's in fact something that people use a lot more often for Q, Q learning. Uh, which is what like you're trying to comp you're trying to keep a uh, old version of your Q function and then most of the things you do is with the average old estimate of the Q function that's in fact the averaging of the parameters is something that or averaging of gradients is something that you can do even here we were doing momentum type methods um so that's definitely something you can also do um there are a few other uh, things that you could do. You could do something as simple as just clip the gradients. Uh, very simple, but also seems to work uh, reasonably well. Uh, so you just make sure that you don't take a huge gradient in any, any of the parameters, very similar to the trust region thing we talked about. Um, and there is, which is, this is sort of where the policy grade, uh, a lot of the, Articulatic stuff comes in, you use something called advantage estimates or baseline. Oh man, what am I writing? And like the general idea here without, without going into too many details is that this, this J that we computed is sort of like, I mean, it's fine, but you could do something better, right? Like if all that we are doing is trying to weigh the gradients and average the gradients somehow to compute the gradient estimates, there's probably something better we can do. And a lot of advantage estimates based methods, what they do is that you actually don't care about the entire trajectory of examples. What you actually want to do is replace this J with something like JN minus B, which is sort of a baseline. And this baseline could be state dependent. And this could look something like a value function when that's when that's the case. And what that essentially does is I'm removing the if, if I have let's say five actions that I'm taking, I'll remove the average value or, or I'll subtract the average value across all of those five actions. And what that does, it it the the weighing that I do between actions is only going to depend on how much I vary from the mean value, um, right? Uh, you don't actually care about the absolute values. You only care about how much better you are from the average action you could have taken. 
Um, and so that's sort of what advantage estimates sort of try to do. There are, again, I, we don't have time, so I'll probably skip going into the details, but and, and there are ways to generalize this. And that's sort of what leads you into actor critic methods, which is where you sort of use a critic or a value function to estimate the baseline. And similarly to estimate the cost to go, instead of trying to estimate the cost to go itself, you can try to use a Q function or you can try to use a value function plus reward um, or sorry, value function plus cost in this case um, to, to estimate that. And, and what all of this, that lets you do is sort of reduce the gradients again. Um, and uh, again, I think we should probably wrap up because we sort of almost are out of time. Um, and sort of what we've seen is Again, policy gradient methods have their drawbacks. They have high variance, they have issues. They can lead to a lot of instabilities. Q learning methods also have issues. Um, they also have, they have a high bias. They can mess up your updates as well. You need to be careful. You have a bunch of tricks. You need to make sure you understand where the bias comes from. You need to understand where the variance comes from. You need to, when you're using some of these tricks, you need to see what they're trying, if at all, and what they're trying to address. And uh, which is sort of where the actor critic methods come in, where they try to say that since both of these methods have these issues, we'll try to go somewhere in between and try to balance this trade off between variance and bias. And um, but even when you go there, the core considerations of bias and variance are still going to remain. And a lot of the methods to reduce bias and variance are still going to be the same things that we just discussed for the few learning and the policy gradient methods. Um, and ultimately, a lot of these solutions that we talked about or people use will look like tricks, hacks. Um, and that's just something we have to deal with uh, and get used to. And one of the reasons we have to get used to them is because these methods do seem to work reasonably well, especially one of the reasons, because they work so well um, with deep networks, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason it's that's as powerful, and the reason I'm mentioning that again is because we've had a decade of research on using deep networks for a lot of things, and we have huge data sets, not robotics related, just vision data sets, just language data sets, which we can sort of leverage, right? They're already there online. You can learn powerful function approximators from just the data sets we have online, uh, offline data sets. And once, you have that repository to draw from. You can sort of transfer a lot of that knowledge for a lot of the planning problems we do. You can, the, the base function approximator that you're trying to learn might be, um, or the additional information that you might want to give to that function approximator might be minimal using RL or whatever. But the thing is it works really well in an RL type setting. And um, which, is, which is why it's, all of this is useful. Um, and in fact, one of the things we didn't address in our discussion today was in a lot of cases, we don't even have access to the cost function. Um, uh, we forget about the model, like in a lot of the manipulation scenarios, you can't even describe the cost function really well. Um, and so in a lot of those cases, you might want to get access to the cost function using some demonstrations or existing videos that you might have of humans doing those tasks. Um, and so, which is why integrating these methods with deep networks ends up I think is as useful as it can be. Um, but having said that, uh, the question is where, like this was an optimal control class for the most part, where does this fit into all the optimal control stuff that you guys have read? And when you have reasonably good physics models, right? Um, we actually don't have really good data for that online. Um, so the ideal thing to do with that, there would be like for scenarios where you have reasonably good physics, which will be a lot of the low level control that you do use optimal control methods, do the low-level low planning using um, methods that you've learned so far. But then when it comes to high-level planning, stuff that you can actually use this auxiliary data from, from the web, from other sources of information, from demonstrations that you can get, give as humans, um, you should probably use something like RL or something like imitation learning using these neural nets type things. Um, and in fact, I'd go a step further. Like, in fact, if, if you actually just want to work on RL and don't actually care about robotics, you should probably look at other problems, which I think are a lot more interesting at this point because of these large language models and large models that are available now. Um, and for example, navigating the web as an agent is a super hard problem, which only recently got feasible because we have access to large models. Um, likewise, interactive teaching or like interacting with humans only recently got feasible. Um, likewise, coordinating with humans, like so many problems 
have gotten feasible because deep networks or large models have gotten so good very recently, right? And so that's like, if you're even thinking of working on RL at some point, that's what you should be looking like. You should be seeing if you can get access to a large enough data set, which you can leverage to ease up a lot of the pain that you'll have with RL. Um, and the last thing I'd say is that if you have a good simulator, if you have good physics, if you have good cost functions, just don't like it's already solved. So don't don't worry too much about it. And with that, hopefully, like we'll we'll end this just in the nick of time. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. And I'm guessing next week it's going to be project presentations. Um, hope to see you some of you some of these things, do some of these things in your projects. All right. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.